Next, Doug Zipes is joined by Dr. Mark Link, professor of medicine at Tufts University Medical Center. They discuss getting patient selection right. Are the new guidelines good enough? Mark, a pleasure to talk with you today about CRT and the guidelines. Give us a little background about CRT, why it's needed, and how it's used. Yeah, CRT, or cardiac resynchronization therapy, also previously known as biventricular pacing, was an entity that came about 10, 15 years ago when individuals saw these dilated hearts with left bundles and noticed that the septum contracted far before the left free wall. And so they developed a system in which you could have simultaneous pacing of the septum and the left free wall. And this came out in experimental trials to actually show benefit to a high number of patients. And it's fascinating that it does provide, first of all, a mechanical therapy for heart failure and actually can induce reverse remodeling. Yeah, it's fascinating that it can take these dilated hearts in these individuals and over time shrink them and increase their ejection fraction. So in general, there have been many patients who have received these devices, and we know that with whatever criteria, there's 30, 40% that appear to be non-responders. And over the years, there has been increasing focus on how to better select patients and also where to put the leads. I know Heart Rhythm Journal is almost inundated by, I've got the best method where to put the lead. I've got the best selection criteria for which patients should respond. My patients respond as super responders and so on. As we've discussed this, we know that there are three societies that have created new guidelines in the past couple of years or so, the ESC, Heart Failure Society, and Heart Rhythm Society. Bring us up to date in terms of what these guidelines now say. Yeah, you bring up an important point about the non-responder, which has always been the Achilles heel of CRT therapy. And I think you're exactly right. The reason for non-responders is multitude, but primarily patient selection and then probably lead placement after that. The early studies of CRT were in sicker patients, class 3 and class 4, and that brought universal happiness or joy in the EP world that you could make these patients much better. This latest set of guideline updates is because of the use and trials of CRT in less sick patients, patients with class 1 and class 2 failure. There have been a number of trials that have come out, randomized very nice trials over the last few years, including made it CRT, reverse, and raft, which looked at the use of CRT devices in less sick populations. They were overwhelmingly similar in that even in these less sick populations, a high percentage of individuals would have clinical benefit. They would have prevention of progression to class 2, class 3, and class 4 heart failure. They'd have improvement in their quality of life and reverse remodeling even in this less sick population. So of those less sick or even the sicker populations, who do we select? Many of them come in with a QRS that's maybe 130 milliseconds duration. Many of them have right bundle branch block versus left bundle branch block. Give us some guidelines as to what the clinician should think about in recommending this patient for CRT. I think that there's been a lot of analysis of these trials that have undergone and really given us much guidance on the kinds of patients that would benefit the most and benefit the least. And I think there are two major electrical parameters that have come out. One is right bundle versus left bundle, and the other is the width of the QRS. Clearly, the patient most likely to benefit is that patient with a wide left bundle, defined as a left bundle greater than 150. This is the sweet spot, the home run in CRT therapy. If you have a patient with a left bundle and a wide QRS, they are the most likely to benefit. The opposite or inverse of that is those individuals with a QRS duration less than 150, so between 120 and 150, and with a right bundle. That population has been very difficult to show a benefit, even in the sicker populations. And certainly, if you look at analysis of the more recent trials in the less sick population that made it CRT, reverse, and raft, the individuals with right bundle between 120 and 150, it's very hard to show a clinical benefit in that population. Presumably, the mechanism of benefit of CRT is to reverse or ameliorate 
mechanical dyssynchrony. So why can't we use uh, strain or speckle Doppler or something like that to identify a mechanical abnormality, even though the QRS is not that prolonged? Yeah, this is a question that's gone back many years, is that since these devices are mechanically affecting synchrony, why can't we use a mechanical test of synchrony in order to predict and pick the patients that would benefit? However, despite several trials attempting to use mechanical desynchrony measures in order to pick patients for CRT, none of these trials of patients that have narrow QRSs or QRSs less than 130 have shown any benefit of CRT. And it's not entirely clear why the electrical parameters are so much better at predicting response than the mechanical parameters, but they certainly are. So it's more than just the mechanics. Obviously, the electrical event is important as well. That said, where do you put the left ventricular lead? That's one of the other features that can affect response rates. In analysis of a number of these trials, probably the worst place to put the lead is in the apex. And that actually makes sense. The apex, no matter whether it's anterior, lateral, or inferior, should be avoided in placement of an LV lead. Clearly, the sweet spot, at least the thought sweet spot, is the left lateral wall mid to base. However, analysis of the immediate CRT trial have also shown that the anterior wall is not as poor of a placement position as we had previously thought, nor is the posterior wall. So I think the important part is avoid the apex. All right. So we've got a group of patients with a left bundle of 150 milliseconds. We put the left ventricular lead in a reasonable site and we now pace these patients. What can I expect in terms of outcome? It does depend on how sick the individual is. The sicker the individual, the more benefit they get. The responders, which in most trials are between 70 and 80 percent, will have an improvement in quality of life, improvement in six-minute walk. They'll have a drop in their class of heart failure and an improved overall well-being and as well as changes in remodeling. Over time, you'll see the LP cavity shrink and the ejection fraction improve. That's in a responder. However, that's only about 70% of patients. And do they need pacing forever? That's a very good question. I mean, no trial has ever taken them off CRT pacing, and I think that you'll never see a trial like that. Once you've had benefit with LV pacing, I think most patients and physicians would be loath to stop LV pacing. Well, Mark, this has been a very helpful discussion, and I think the clinicians certainly will benefit from these new guidelines and helping them select patients for what can be life-saving therapy for the appropriately selected individual. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, Doug.